Hello magpies, and welcome to an introduction to the languages, the backgrounds, and the national identities of my D&D world, an alternate future of the Forgotten Realms. Over this series, I will provide you with the rules and the story concepts for playing as an inhabitant of any one of over 40 different nations of Faerun. Part mechanics and part lore, this series is intended to help you to make a character in my world and to align your backstory with the campaign, or just to learn more about the Forgotten Realms and to inspire your own world building adventures. A lot of the information in this video is taken from the third edition Forgotten Realms campaign setting, which is an absolutely top tier feat of world building. The relevant parts of which I have converted for use in the fifth edition. I shall furnish you therefore with my homebrew rules for languages, with my modifications to backgrounds, and also with a list of bonuses I hand out to those who align their backstories with a defined homeland and culture. Let's get swoopy and begin. First of all, I want it noted that I do not use common as a language in my world. Whenever the game refers to the common tongue, understand it to mean the most commonly spoken language in that part of the world. In Cormia and in the Western Heartlands, this is Chondathan. Across the north, it is Damaran. In the east, it is a mix with Mulhorandi being the most politically dominant. While in the south, it is a linguistic free-for-all. With perhaps the language of the Sharan tribesmen being the most geographically dominant. Now, I acknowledge that this does place some burden on characters who come from exotic lands and must therefore pick a background, a race, or a feat that gives a bonus language just to communicate. But if I know D&D players, having a unique and exotic character is kind of the whole point. So to this effect, I will allow players who take the skill expert feat or skilled feat to replace one of the bonus proficiencies given with a bonus language instead. I have also introduced two new languages to the game to give it a more medieval European feel. The first is La Rosse, which is roughly equivalent to French, being the high class language spoken at court. The second is Thoras, roughly equivalent to Latin, being the language of highly educated persons spoken at universities by doctors, by lawyers, and by priests. Generally speaking, if you want to rub shoulders with the elite or be involved in court intrigues, it is important to learn La Rosse. And if you want an education beyond basic reading, writing, and arithmetic, you will find it far easier if you know Thoras. I've also added these languages to certain background packages to make it easier to navigate society. So therefore, the following high-class backgrounds all receive La Rosse as a bonus language, being a celebrity adventurer's scion, courtier, knight, knight of the order, and entertainer. Though it should be noted that with entertainers, it only really applies to those who perform for the upper classes, like a court jester or a troubadour poet. A juggler or a fire eater, on the other hand, might not necessarily have cause to learn. Likewise, the following backgrounds receive Thoras as a bonus language, being acolyte, anthropologist, archaeologist, cloistered scholar, and guild artisan. Though again, with guild artisans, this only applies to physicians, alchemists, scribes, and other formally educated persons. Not so much to blacksmiths or to peasant herbalists. 
Finally, the following backgrounds receive both Loros and Thoras as bonus languages. Being Noble, Sage, Vizier, and Waterdavian Noble. Now, this is just a general guideline, and you should speak to your DM if your background is not on one of these lists, but you think that your story justifies being able to speak one of these elite languages. So, still, while we're still on the topic of backgrounds, I have reskinned a few backgrounds for uh, from other campaign settings, so as to better fit the realms of heterodoxy. First of all, the anthropologist background. It might well represent a migrant from another culture who has become naturalized through cultural immersion. But you should keep in mind that if you frame it this way, it no longer makes sense to have Laros as a bonus language since it is no longer a formal academic background. But regardless, it may be a nice, simple and easy way to justify an exotic homeland while also gaining that all-important bonus language slot. Continuing a Grinner background from the Wildmount campaign setting would be perfectly suited to being a Harper minstrel, seeking out and undoing tyranny across the world, while a plaintiff from Acquisitions Incorporated could be a convert to the heretical faith, having the means to travel to the Sunset Vale in pursuit of their new life. A Simic scientist from the Ravnica setting is perfectly suited to be a member of the Thaumaturgist cult that worships technological innovation and human progress, even above the gods themselves. A Volstrucker agent from Wildmount could be a guild assassin, associated with such groups as the Royal Heralds, the Fire Knives, or the Night Blades among other such groups of professional killers. Finally, a Witchlight Hand from the Wild Beyond the Witchlight sourcebook could be either a nomadic Gua soothsayer or a person who grew up in the Endless Revel, the never-ending festival to the goddess Shares. Okay, okay. So now we've got your background sorted. Let's talk about your homeland and how this will affect your starting equipment, languages and proficiencies. In my experience, around 90% of all D&D characters are unique one in a million archetypes with no strong ties to the community and no living relatives. For the other 10%, I have created an incentive system for their ironically unique playstyle of not standing out. To qualify, you must tie your backstory to a certain part of the world with ties to your home community and you must in some way justify your character as a product of that society rather than merely as another Nietzschean superman going their own way. If you do this simple task, you will receive bonus equipment and, in some cases, bonus proficiencies. So over this seven-part series, I'm going to briefly introduce all major narrative countries in Faerun. And each region will list between one and four equipment packages. You may pick one from the list, and if it gives you a weapon, a tool, or a set of armor, you are considered automatically proficient in that weapon, tool, or armor. Though you should note that this only applies to the item listed. For example, if you receive a longsword, then you gain proficiency in longswords, but not in martial weapons. And the same applies for exotic reskinning of weapons. For example, if you receive a kukri, you gain proficiency in kukris, but not in daggers, even though a kukri and a dagger share the same stats. 
Finally, and before we get into it, let's quickly cover a special weapon rule that may pop up, and also how to use potions that you might gain that are not found in the basic core rules. So, Mighty. Mighty is a special rule that can be applied to bows, but not to crossbows or other weapons. It represents a large bow with a particularly massive draw that favours the strong. With a mighty weapon, you may choose to substitute strength for dexterity when using the weapon, basically the inverse of finesse. Continuing, uh, likewise, if you receive a potion with an associated spell name like a potion of invisibility, as a general rule, when drunk, the potion creates the effect of the spell with all normal limitations and criteria. But critically, it does not require concentration. Okay, okay. Finally, bookkeeping aside, we are now ready to go over the regions. And we will organize them by the five palatinates. And in this video, we shall cover the central region and the imperial capital. You should note that this is by no means an exhaustive list of all independent kingdoms, baronies, and principalities across Faerun. Neither does it provide more than a passing glimpse into these cultural and political bodies beyond what a stranger might read in a book. The spell plague left scars and political upheavals across the world that may take generations to resolve or even to fully manifest. The true stories of many of these places and the depths of these scars have yet to be unveiled, yet to be told. And I include these nations to stir interest in their names, even if they are not central to the story, so that they may one day become heroes in their own stories. All right, let us begin. The central Palatinate and the Imperial Capital answers directly to Cormia. These nations rank among the wealthiest, most lawful, or most stable due to their privileged access to the capital and to the temperate climate. The seat of the Emperor's throne, the Forest Kingdom of Cormia, is home to a strong adventuring tradition, to a lineage of kings that goes back centuries, and Likewise to the professional armies of the Purple Dragon Knights, arguably the most powerful military force in the West. They also homed the Inquisition, the central religious and administrative body organizing society. Nonetheless, Cormirians tend to see themselves as underdogs, despite their geopolitical importance and will revel in revel in tales of the everyman outsmarting all adversaries. Inhabitants of Cormia speak Chondathan as their common tongue, and may take, one, may take one of three equipment packages, which relate to their concept or backstory in some way. For example, the splint armor could indicate a military or guardsman history that would require them to stand at attention in heavy armor for long periods of time. The scrolls could indicate education, for even if you are not a spellcaster, in some ways it is much smarter to carry valuable spell scrolls around than it is to lug about large bags of gold. And finally, to take the weapon either a warhammer or a longsword, this could represent the Comirian attitude of self-sufficiency or the call to adventure. You should feel free to get as creative as you like to justify your equipment choices from any region, even beyond the suggestions I offer. 
The major faiths of Cormier are Lathanda, which is the official state religion of the Inquisition, but also Chontia, Denia, Helm, Lyra, Ogma, Malar, Melil, Selune, Sylvanus, Tempus, Timora, Joaquin, and the heretical Valdensian cult that masquerades as followers of Denia. You should note that this is far from a complete list of all faiths to be found in the region, just the most prominent ones. Finally, and this is the case with almost all fantasy worlds, there are implicit historical anal analogues written into the lore. In the world of Toril, Maztica is analogous to Preconquista South America, Zakara is Africa, Karatua is Asia, Ose is Australia, and Faerun is Europe. I like to draw out, interpret, and magnify these analogues because they provide a useful outline that adds an, 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 an intuitive element to the narrativization, while also leaving ample room for artistic flourishes. Cormier, for its historical analogues, it gives me vibes of the English Midlands, such as Nottingham Forest and the myth of Robin Hood. The English analogue plays out pretty well too, with uh, Cormier's powerful barons, their progressive attitudes to the rights of peasants, and also their wavering status as a colonial superpower. So next to the northeast of Cormier is the Dale Lands, a largely unsettled wilderness of hardy forest dwellers and independent regions known as Dales. The whole area is considered important neutral territory where the Council of Shieldmeat gathers every leap year to respond to threats to the Empire whereby diplomats and kings gather at the site of major battles intended to dissuade rulers from the ravages of war. Though the individual Dales do vary greatly, for the most part the men and women of the Dales live free, in tune with nature and are largely unconcerned with the politics of nations. Inhabitants of the Dales speak Chondathan as their common tongue, and healthy, strong individuals tend to practice with the bow, with the Dale longbow being a highly sought after weapon. Thus, they may choose either a mighty longbow with arrows or a mighty short bow with arrows. Alternatively, they may take either a spear or a potion of greater healing, representing just anyone with the good sense to equip themselves well before heading out into the wild, untamed forests. The major faiths of the Greater Dale Land area are Chontia, Lathanda, Mialiki, Sylvanus, Tempus, and the Triad of Ilmata, Torm, and Tia. Though, if you do really want to get technical, worship and culture varies by Dale, and I don't really want to list them all, so for the sake of brevity, let's just do a quick montage while I list my favorite types of cheese. <clears throat> Halloumi, paneer, brie, cheddar, Old English, feta, mozzarella, Parmesan, cream cheese, camembert, mascarpone, and the soft cheese that comes in the round box with the cow's face on the front, whatever that one's called, you, you know the one. All right, so appropriately, the historical analogues of the Dale lands are also as varied as the individual Dales, but 
I find that the general theme of a relatively isolated frontier land of historical troubles, of powerful fey kingdoms, and of pastoral ideals evokes a kind of a mythical echo of Wales and Ireland. The Dragon Coast is a collection of independent city-states and pirate enclaves, full of wealth, intrigue, and danger, built on the back of ancient civilizations. Everything has a price on the Dragon Coast, and the price is often more reasonable than in other places. The trick is making it out alive, however. Their capital, Westgate, was built around a giant pyramid made to house an ancient dragon that once ruled this whole region. Today, Westgate is one of the most technologically advanced cities in the world due to a deal they struck with the apostate al Hazred for his technology. It is a city of steampunk marvels not found anywhere else in the world. Inhabitants of the Dragon Coast speak Chondathan as their native tongue, and the available equipment packages reflect these criminal and mercantile roots of this land. They may take a weapon, either a rapier or a light crossbow and bolts, or alternately they may choose between one of two protective potions, either a potion of blur or a potion of resistance. The major faiths of the Dragon Coast are Helm, Sune, Tempus, Timora, and Umbali. It is also home to the heretical Formaturgist cult, masquerading as followers of Gond, and also the Methuselan cult of Marsala, popular among sailors. The historical analogues of the Dragon Coast have echoes in the Italian city-states, especially Venice, mixed as well with the exotic appeal of Constantinople. But a visitor to Westgate might well feel that they were in Atlantis itself. Sembia is an old and fairly militaristic nation, ruled by wizards and often disliked by their neighbours. They gain some mastery of Netherese magic in centuries past, which they use to cloak their homeland in a shield of darkness, protecting their interests from outside interference. Isolated, they gain their own variant language, based on Chondathan and Damaran, called Zembian, which they developed over time. After their protective barrier collapsed during the Spell Plague, Sembia was conquered by Cormia. Today, they maintain their magicratic government, but have also embraced the free market, becoming highly successful in the commercial sphere. Inhabitants of Sembia speak both Chondathan and Zembian as their common tongues, but they only have one piece of regional equipment to choose from, as every Sembian understands that magic and money equals power. Therefore, Sembian adventurers tend to be better equipped than most, having taken the time to acquire fortune before fame. For their good sense, they receive a whopping extra 300 starting gold. The major faiths of Sembia are Azuth, Denia, Lathanda, Leviathan, Mistra, Shah, Sune, Timora, and Joaquin. Regarding Sembia's historical analogues, I interpret the Damaran language group as being the Germanic peoples, and I play this up in Symbia. With its dark history of conquest and isolationism, its strong national pride and its mercantile influence, 
I find uh, Prussia to be a good analogue for Sembia, being a bastion of exotic influences and colonial themes in the easternmost reaches of the West. Though today, with Sembia's current deference to Cormia, perhaps Prussia under Napoleon would be a better analogue. Okay, thank you magpies, and that concludes the Central Palatinate. But we have many, many more nations to cover. Next time, we will push westward into the fantastical and wealthy frontiers of the Faerunian homeland. Faerunian heartlands, I mean. I look forward to seeing you there.